Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who is a daredevil, just like his father. Here is the captain. Yeah, grab life by the horns and don't let go, you filthy animals. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today in the garage, we are sipping on some tiramisu stout by Ellison Brewing Plus Spirits in beautiful East Lansing, Michigan. I would describe this as a dessert coffee stout. It's full bodied as one would expect and quite delicious. Three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. And before we get into this week's case, a few shout outs to our good garage friends. First up, a cheers to the very handsome and also quite brilliant Eric with a CK up in Lindsay, Ontario. And a big We Like Your Jib goes out to Graham in Eugene, Oregon. Next up, a cheers to Robert P. in Worthington. And last but certainly not least, we have Cole in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to truecrimegarage.com, clicked on the pint glass, and contributed to helping us fill up the old garage fridge for this week's show. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W W R U N Beer Run. You know you need more True Crime Garage for your ear balls. You know, after this episode, you're going to go, hey, I wish there was another episode. And guess what? There's a bunch of other episodes. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast, just hit subscribe, or you can go over to Patreon and sign up there. And Colonel, that's enough of the beers. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Look up at the street lights. Running all over. over. Look up at the street lights. Running all over, over. It has been almost five months since the shooting death of Kane Coronado. He was shot on his bike on November 1st on Indian Mounds Drive in Wyoming. Tonight, police are now sharing a sketch of a person of interest in his death. 13 On Your Side's Micah Cho is live from where it happened with reaction from his family and the new information from police. Micah. Good afternoon. It was this exact spot where Kane Coronado was killed back in November. And all that's left here now is this small memorial, this cross here, and their, his family's continued hunt for answers. Now, investigators with the Wyoming Department of Public Safety describes this person they're looking for is a 30 year old male with a light with a thin light or gray beard and may have been wearing a beanie or stocking cap. Police may have been say he may have been driving an older style gray four-door car as well. Coronado's grandma, Tanya Ferguson, spoke with us this afternoon about the subject's description coming out today. Ferguson said that while they're glad there's now a description, she's wondering why it took almost five months for it to come out. Nonetheless, every day she and her family still hope they can find justice for her grandson. I want justice for Kate. I want justice for my grandson. You, whoever you are, took him. And for what reason? There, was, there is no reason. Kane was shot at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon here off of Indian Mounds Drive, so the suspect would have been leaving this area around that time. And if you have any information on the murder of Kane Coronado or the suspect that you saw earlier uh, this afternoon, you're asked to call the Wyoming Department of Public Safety or Simon Observer. Look up at the street lights Running all over, over Look up at the street lights Running all over, over Well, Captain, we've got to go back to Tuesday, November 1st, 2022. This is to Wyoming, not the state but the city of Wyoming. This is Wyoming, Michigan. Police were called to the 2200 block of Indian Mounds Drive Southwest. This was at 2.50 in the afternoon. Police are responding to a report of a shooting. The shooting victim was 18-year-old Kane Coronado, who was shot in the neck. This youngster, Kane, was an avid bike rider and a rather skilled bike rider at that. Wyoming police were on the scene quickly. 
They would later tell members of the media that Kane was alone at the time of the shooting. A nice person, a good Samaritan, stepped in and was the first to give Kane CPR. But unfortunately, Kane would not survive the gunshot. Captain, it sounds like multiple shots were fired with only one hitting this young man. But one was enough. And very sadly, on the afternoon of November 1st, 2022, yet another community lost another one of its young people due to gun violence. Well, let's dive into some of the details of the actual crime. What we do know is he was out riding his bike when he was shot. So sadly, Kane died lying beside his beloved bike on Indian Mounds Drive in Wyoming, Michigan. Kane Coronado is remembered as an 18-year-old who was just learning to find his way in this big world, a young man who loved his friends and his bicycle. It sounds to me, Captain, like Kane was having some trouble with home life and family life in his teenage years. Yeah. And at the age of 18, when he was 17, he was kind of couch surfing. He did live with his grandmother for a while, and she's done some interviews on this case with the local news. Her name is Tanya Ferguson, and police are still looking for whoever did this. This this seems to be not a targeted murder, but more of a random murder. Right. One thing that I, I believe would have been difficult for police in this investigation is given his Kane's social circle in his family life. So he did not have a traditional family life or experience. And I don't know the details of that or why, but when he was 18, he was no longer living with his family. He did stay close with his grandmother. We know that. And he was very close with one of his cousins. Uh, he was living with some friends that were a little bit older. I believe a husband and wife that were four or five years older than Kane and Kane had got a job. He dropped out of high school, but he got a job as a dishwasher. He was, you know, actually collecting a weekly check at this point. And he was a member of this, this group. So this group was called the big rippers 616. So Kane and his fellow bike riding friends belong to a group called big rippers 616. Shortly after the murder, that group held a memorial ride for Kane that they ran from downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan to Wyoming, Michigan, which is very nearby. Right. So this is all taking place on the west side of the state of Michigan. And the area where he was shot is called Millennium Park. If you look up some news, news articles online, and there's several good ones out there on this case, some of them will show you exactly where Kane was found. And it's believed that he was where he was found is where he, the attack took place. And the strange thing about this is police would tell us later that they are looking for a suspect, that they have at least one witness who saw the shooter and saw the shooter's vehicle. And so we have a, a suspect description and a vehicle description. But the strange thing, and I was trying to get in touch with some local people there because I'm not familiar with this area, but every map that I look at and the description that's provided about this Millennium Park, he's riding a bike where people would ride bikes, where people would walk, where people would walk their dogs. Right. He, so he wasn't riding on the road. He's in a park. He crosses paths somehow with a motorist right and there's a chance that when their paths cross that the motorist is driving in an area where where there's no cars where there's no traffic where cars should not be and yeah, and, and very strange yeah and this is one detail that i wish that we knew and of course when we go through these cases there's a reason why they are unsolved and there's a lot of blanks to be filled in Somebody obviously was very angry with Kane, whether the, the person knew Kane or not. It seems to be that police think that the, the shooter did not know the victim and the victim did not know the shooter. And so something took place while he was out riding his bike that day. Did it did their first interaction take place and then he's gunned down right then and there or or did they cross paths prior? Can we go over the eyewitness accounts? Of the event the the crazy thing here captain is 
We know that police say that they were interviewing and and talking to witnesses, plural, at the scene, which would make sense. This is this is a murder that took place in broad daylight and the victim shot. The call comes in at 250 in the afternoon. So the victim shot prior to that, that Good Samaritan is attempting to save his life performing CPR on Kane. We know that police were interviewing witnesses, plural. One thing that I would like some clarification on is later when we get the description of the shooter, that description is usually prefaced by saying a a witness saw and then it gives the description so i wanted to know how many people saw this this vehicle and saw the the shooter and do we have do we have a mixed bag do we have several right. people that saw the vehicle and, but not the shooter and so unfortunately as we said kane's out riding he, he's riding this 26 inch bike it's most of the pictures that I've seen of him, he's riding what I would describe as a, a mountain bike, you know, a larger bike. He was known as the one of the nicknames that this group gave him was the Wheelie King of Grand yeah. Rapids. That was my that, nickname in high school. I, I wish that was my nickname in high school. Yeah, the Wheelie and King. They show a lot of pictures of him online where he is he's riding a wheelie, front wheel in the air, back wheel on the asphalt, and he's in he and doing it comfortably. So they called him the yeah. Wheelie King of Grand Rapids. And one person, uh, Matthew Wayne Crawford, who was was a friend and a member of this biking group, he said, uh, quote, Kane could wheelie further than anyone in Grand Rapids, and that's a fact. Well, I'd like to take him up on a challenge. The only problem is my wheelies were done on rollerblades. Kane didn't have a driver's license, but he didn't just ride for necessity. He rode for fun. As we said, he was a member of this group. So he's out riding that day like anyone would expect him to. What transpires after that in that short period of time, we don't know exactly. But what we are told is police are saying, We are looking for one, anyone that was in this Millennium Park area between the hours of 2 and 3 p.m. on November 1st, 2022. So this is still a relatively fresh case. You know, this is not even two years old at this point with us having this conversation. And so we're looking for one, anyone that was in the area between the hours of 2 and 3 p.m. on November 1st, 2022. They're also looking for the person that's described as the shooter. So As far as an autopsy and a lot of that information goes, there's not a lot to discuss here. Unfortunately, he was shot in the neck and died on the scene, and he was unable to tell the person performing CPR or first responders or police when they arrived on the scene very quickly who shot him. The description we get of the crime and of of the shooting, it's described as, you know, I heard several shots is right. what one of the ear witnesses is telling police. I heard several shots. I don't know how many shots exactly were fired. Unfortunately, we do know that one hit this young man in the neck, and that is what killed him. I don't know, Captain, if the the ear witness is the same as the eyewitness who spotted the suspect. But I would like to talk about this suspect here because this is something that police and the, the Wyoming Michigan Police Department would want discussed. This is something that we need to crowdsource. And I know that they've attempted to crowdsource this locally. I would imagine that they've received some tips over time here. But with this case, one thing that I found odd is the description is not available to the public in the early stages of the investigation. That is wonky donkey that doesn't make any sense well and i have to i have to believe that there's likely good reason for that that's what makes me suspect that maybe there's more than one eyewitness one would hope but but i think you're spot on if there's multiple eyewitnesses and one witness is saying well i saw a younger man or i saw an older man go back to the delphi case right We have a sketch of one man, and then years later, we have a sketch of a younger man. So, okay, so maybe it is a little wonky donkey, 
But if I'm law enforcement and I have multiple depictions of this person and they're not lining up, and we know, I would surmise that these eyewitnesses aren't lying to law enforcement. But again, I was a banker. Before I was a captain, I was a banker. And they did test after test after test. Four people could get robbed, and they have four different descriptions of the robber. It's just human nature, especially in such a dramatic situation. Well, what we did get uh, in the early stages of the investigation was a vehicle description. So police were looking for a vehicle that has been described as a gray or silver four-door Chevrolet Cavalier 2000 to 2005 model. Also known as the butt face mobile because whoever shot him is a butt face. Well, one thing that I'm curious about here, Captain. I'll call you George. Gray or silver four-door Chevrolet Cavalier 2000 to 2005 model. That is rather descriptive to, to go to make and model and narrow it down to a few years. We've seen this in other cases. Typically what happens here is you go from getting a description of the vehicle from eyewitnesses to then showing them here's a 2001 Chevy Cavalier four door. Did it look like this? Right. Here's a, you, you show them pictures of multiple vehicles and which one did it look like? Unless somebody specifically told them, it's a Chevy Cavalier. How did you know it was a Chevy Cavalier? Well, I've seen a thousand of them, or I used to own one. Right. Um, I believe somebody that used to own one. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to even admit if you owned a Chevy, <laughs> Chevy Cavalier. Well, the other part of that is some of the news that's that's come out looking for the suspect has. A slightly different description. So again, described as a gray or silver four-door Chevy Cavalier, but but they say in those other descriptions that it was a gray or silver four-door vehicle likely or similar to a right. Chevy Cavalier 2000 to 2005 model year. It's tough though, too, because cars, especially a, a Chevy Cavalier, which was so popular, and if anybody's butt hurt, guess what? The captain owned and drove a Chevy Cavalier. So it's very Cavalier of you. It's very Cavalier of me to say, but, but they change their models often. So it's like sometimes when they come out with a new model, it looks more like a, a Malibu or, or, or whatever. Well, and I wanted to be clear in, in that statement, because if this information should hit somebody's earballs and they think that they have some relevant information right. to provide to police, don't dismiss somebody as being a good suspect just because they drove a gray or silver four-door vehicle that was not a Chevy Cavalier. Right. Do could, do could have been a Ford Escort. Yes, do know that some of the some of the call for action here, some of those calls to action are saying that it was similar to a Chevy Cavalier or could have been a Chevy Cavalier. So don't dismiss somebody just because it's not that exact make and model later what we get is well, hold on one second just to repeat this over and over if you saw something say something if you have any information at all say something what's the worst thing that could happen they take the report and they don't use the information it's it's better and and look a lot of people that witness crimes Years down the line, they'll feel guilty and go, well, I need to tell police. Well, if it's 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line, the details become more and more blurry. So if you saw something, say something. The other thing, too, here, Captain, is this case reminds me of one that we covered not too long ago. And I don't want to go into the specifics of that case. And you know why. Uh, we don't need to inform all the listeners on everything. But in that case, it seemed like a random shooting. That one took place in the middle of the night. Similar situation, except for our victim was not alone. And we did have a witness. In that case, it was just simply an ear witness 
So that case, we had very little information, and it seemed like a stranger on stranger crime that their paths just happened to cross in the middle of the night. Somebody pulls out a gun and shoots the other person. Victim right. dies. And in that case, I, to be honest with you, I, while we when we covered it and us delivering the information to all the beautiful listeners out there, I was giving the tone of being hopeful that the case would be solved while in, on the inside feeling like it was such a random crime and that that I didn't see the likelihood of it being solved. You and I now know that it has been solved, right. that, that they've definitively linked that to a very good suspect in that case to the point where police will be willing at some point to say such and such person committed this murder. This case reminds me of that one because I sit here and I go, man, this how difficult can this be for detectives? You are, right. you arrive on the scene, you have a, a victim who you have to spend days now making sure that this wasn't a target attack, a targeted attack. You have to spend days making sure that Kane didn't upset somebody or aggravate somebody in his social circle or even in his family to the point that they track him down, find him on the street and, and gun him down. What we do have is police telling us today and actually within weeks of that of the their investigation, they are saying we've ruled that out. We've ruled out the possibility of of him being targeted. We couldn't right. find anything or any evidence to suggest that somebody would want to take revenge on Kane. So now what we're looking for, what we're left with is this vehicle description and the description of the suspect. So the suspect is described and Captain, you'll know what I'm talking about because we've looked at this case now for a couple of days. I'm a little surprised at the how brief the description is of this suspect when the composite sketch of the suspect is so detailed. Right. So the brevity of the uh s description of this person seems odd to me so here's the the description a witness described the suspect as a 30 year old white man anybody that's seen the composite sketch will i think will agree with me that if this man is 30 it's been a rough 30 years for this person yeah a 30 year old white male he had a thin, light gray colored beard and was wearing a beanie or stocking cap. The witness also recalled the suspect having a thin build and wearing scruffy clothes. So scruffy clothes is one thing. The, the, the image of this person is scruffy from head to toe, from the tip top of that beanie cap to, to this suspect's toes. His, his face is disheveled to say the, the least. Yeah, uh, when you see the picture and you you hear this this description, my thought was, does this individual live in their car? The other thing here, Captain, that's interesting, they say scruffy clothes, scruffy beard too. This beard is it's a disgrace to beards. Yeah, he's a beardo weirdo. But or weirdo beardo. What we have is this very detailed composite sketch. We have the description of the vehicle that was seen in the area at the time, and they're connecting well, these things, saying that th this is what's going to help us find the shooter, help us find the killer. Right. What I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around is if somebody got this detailed of a look of this suspect, how do we not have a little bit better of a description of the vehicle or even some type of license plate information? Did this car not have plates on it? Right. Or in some states, they only have to have plates on the back. Did they only see the car from the front? Exactly. There's there's a little bit of information that's missing here, and I'm hoping that police and detectives are not holding back anything that could help provide additional information to the public that could get them the right tip coming in. Here's a story behind the scenes of the shoe industry. The stark contrast between a premium shoemaker and those riding on massive advertising budgets. Enter G-Defy Shoes, a true departure 
from the ordinary backed by a groundbreaking clinical study conducted by UCLA. G Defy stands apart with its patented and meticulously designed sole construction. It isn't just about absorbing shock. It's like your shoes giving you a high five with every step, boosting you forward and adding a pep to your stroll. G Defy isn't just grabbing any old sole off the shelf. They're on a mission to boost the biometrics of how shoes work and foster a movement that nurtures your body. G Defy's investment is channeled into the foundational construction of the shoe, a device that alleviates pain and serves as natural footwear to preempt further wear and tear. I absolutely love my G Defy shoes. I was only getting 3,000, maybe 5,000 steps a day because my feet were always hurting. My shoes were working against me. But with G Defy shoes, they work for me. Treat your feet. Treat yourself and give your give your feet a big hug with G Defy shoes. You're going to absolutely love them. Treat yourself and treat your feet. Visit GDefy.com now because your feet deserve more than just another pair of shoes. And here's a little extra love for True Crime Garage listeners. Use discount code GARAGE for exclusive $30 off orders of $150 or more. Yep, you heard it right. A little gift from G Defy to your feet. Experience the miracle that is G Defy, where comfort meets innovation. I don't have a lot of time for shopping, especially shopping for clothing. So when I find something that I love, I return to it. That's why I have been shopping on Quince.com for over a year now. Quince has all the must-haves, like Mongolian cashmere crew neck sweaters from $50, iconic 100% leather jackets, and versatile flow-knit activewear. The best part, all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices, along with premium fabrics and finishes. I love the Quince activewear. And it's available for men and women. And on Quince.com, you can shop for baby and kids as well. Plus, they have travel items, including luggage. I recently picked up a couple pairs of pants. One, the Performance Tech Jogger and the Performance Tech Pant. Both are incredibly comfortable, super durable, and they look fantastic. Indulge in affordable luxury. Go to Quince.com slash garage for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash garage to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash garage. All right, we are back. Cheers to you, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain, and cheers to everybody out there, yeah. all the beautiful listeners. Yeah. And the beautiful listeners are the ones that we are talking to, and police are doing the right thing here, Captain. They are keeping this story in the media. They're keeping the description of the suspect, the suspect vehicle in the media because they know what is going to solve this case, what is going to lead detectives to their suspect is you, the listener, you, the viewer out there that will see something and say something like the captain and I are requesting. So we are reaching out and addressing those of you up in the great state of Michigan, especially the West part of the state. Take the time to go to our social media. Take the time to Google Kane Coronado's name and look at the suspect description. Look at the composite sketch of the suspect and look at the vehicle. So they, they even provided stock footage or stock photo of a similar type vehicle. So for those of you that can't close your eyes and and create an image in your mind of a, of a Chevy Cavalier of those years, or if you need a bit of a refresher, 
right. they have that information available for your eyeballs on the internet. And that's what we are hoping to do here this week. This is a case that is near and dear to the hearts of the people of this community. This was a young man, 18 years old. He's doing what what any of us would want to do on a nice day, right? Hop on a bike and take a nice, enjoyable bike ride down to the park area. This Millennium Park, where he was shot, he's Kane, unfortunately, was found shot near this park. And it appears to me, I don't know, Captain, was he making his way to the park or, or coming from the park? If we believe, and I do believe, Captain, that this could be a road rage type situation. If that, in fact, is the truth, then my guess would be that he was heading toward the park because the park itself, while I've never been there, is described as the largest urban park in West Michigan. So not just in this general area, the largest urban park in the west half of the state. It's located on the southwest side of Grand Rapids. Remember, Grand Rapids is very near Wyoming, Michigan, the city where this unfortunate event took place. And the Millennium Park connects four of the major cities in the area altogether, including Grand Rapids, Wyoming, Granville, and Walker. So this park is rather large. Once you, when you see on the map where he was shot, where he was found, I think it will be obvious to most that he was probably making his way toward that park because he very likely would not have encountered any cars while in the park. And I, I apologize for not giving a better description, but the way that it looks to me and the way that it's laid out does not suggest that there would be cars driving around in this park. Yeah. Ken, a hunch of mine is possibly somebody sleeping in their car in a park or living out of their car in a park. Yes, but he would have been coming, if he was heading toward the park, he would have been coming off of a busy road. Right. And so part of me wonders if he, if that's where he encountered the shooter. Right. Maybe it's a road rage situation where maybe he was riding his bike or cut off a car or something happened and the, the driver got pissed off and decided, well, well, I'm going to show him. Yeah. So on that path there, Captain, there, there should not be vehicles on the path. He's not on the actual path. It, he's making his way toward that path, but this, the location where this went down. And again, we have the ear witness who is saying, I heard several shots. And then we know that the good Samaritan then found the victim attempts to perform CPR, tries to save the life of this young man. And at this spot, the, the media, the local news teams did some gangbusters work on this case because one thing they tell us and one thing they discovered immediately when they went to the area to report the story and they started talking to people there, it was quickly pointed out to the media that, look, you see this sign? This sign says, do not enter. This, is, mm -hmm. this spot is one way. But the people that frequented this area, they start telling the media, look, we think that, and I think they're saying this jokingly, but they're like, we think that some people think that this sign is just a suggestion because cars are frequently coming into this do not enter area. Right. Now we've all been out driving and, and encountered a situation where it's not obvious. If you miss the sign in certain locations, it's, it's not obvious that you're not supposed to drive into that area. So that to me paints a bit of a picture of maybe how this went down. We have an avid bike rider. This dude, Kane, Loved his bike. He loved being a part of this bicycle group. Of He's this, the wheelie king. The wheelie king of Grand Rapids. There is none higher. You can see this picture. He's out riding his bike, going toward this Millennium Park, which would be a desired location for one to go and ride their bike. This vehicle, this older model vehicle, 2000 to 2005, possible Chevy Cavalier, enters going the wrong way, a do not enter section mm -hmm. of the road, was there a, did, did he, did he hit the young man on his bike? Was there a, close to a near miss and then some words exchange? And now we have a road raid situation where this guy, this man, again, described as, as 30 years old, male, white, scruffy looking, 
very ugly beard, wearing a beanie cap, gets out, yeah. pulls the gun, fires some shots toward in the direction of this young man, one of them hitting him. He gets in the vehicle and flees the area. Yeah, Captain Buttface. Unfortunately, we don't get a witness that can give us a license plate. Yeah, Captain Buttface in the Buttface mobile. Back in the day, the captain, it might surprise you, but I used to babysit often. And I had a scenario where we rode our bikes to the park. It was just me. I think he was in middle school at the time. And he was very proficient at riding bikes. He could do wheelies. He could jump things. He could do tricks. And so he wanted to ride his bike. And I'm like, well, your parents don't want me to let you ride your bike by yourself. So I'll go with you. Now I'm riding a bike with him. And we went to cross. It was a little bit of a busier road, but we went to cross. There was no cars that we could see so we started crossing and a car drove by thought that we weren't crossing i guess the road fast enough and and honked at us Mm -hmm. the kid i was babysitting then flips the bird we are probably five six blocks from his house by the time we get back to his house the car had turned around and was then sitting in his driveway two grown men now I want to fight a kid in in high school babysitting a kid in middle school just because they honked their horn and a kid in middle school flipped them off. Mm-hmm. That's what I see happening. I'm not saying that he flipped them the bird or anything, but I'm just saying I think there was some kind of confrontation and maybe, and call me Captain Obvious, but maybe he was when this confrontation happened, maybe it happened on a busier section and he was trying to get to the park knowing that vehicles can't come here. Yeah. Does that make any sense? A general description. Uh, again, we've not been to this area, so it's, it's difficult for us to wrap our heads around some of this, but this Indian mounds drive Southwest is across the grand river from this very large millennium park. And the park is so large that it's difficult to ascertain where the park starts and stops, right? What, what is this Indian mounds drive part of the park? Because when you look at it on a map, it, that would seem to make some sense, but I'm with you. I, I think that this look road rage is a real thing, unfortunately, and it's caused some people to do some horrible things to one another over the years. And I think I don't think that it's coincidence that the media is reporting, hey, when we went to this area and started talking to people, the thing that was pointed out to us is these cars that regularly enter the wrong way, or we have cars where they should not be, where people are out doing recreational type activities. They're walking their dogs, they're they're skating, they're biking. Most people are not going to react kindly to to a vehicle speeding by and almost hitting them or hitting their dog. Yeah. So you're saying it's a, it's a, it's a situation where a car goes into a a place they're not supposed to be. And then maybe in that moment he reacts, Hey, butt face, you're not supposed to be driving your car here. And then dude pulls a gun and, and now we know the rest of the story. But so that grand river is so close to the street. When police get to the scene, they're not just, interviewing anybody that they can find on the road or people out doing those recreational types of activities. Right. They also get in a boat and they are out looking for people in boats that could have possibly heard something or saw something as well. So they were out actively taking statements from anybody that they could find in this area. And then again, doing the right thing by crowdsourcing by reaching out to the general public in the community and saying, we need information from you. We've interviewed everybody in the area that we could find there that day at that time. We need other people. Were you in the park that day? Were you driving by and maybe you saw something important? Maybe somehow you ended up behind this vehicle on the road. You have a highway there, 196, maybe you ended up on the road behind this individual in this this vehicle. Again, right. to be clear, they are comparing the vehicle. Some some articles say Chevy Cavalier 20, 2000 to 2005. Other articles are saying that it's comparable to or could be 
a Chevy Cavalier. Some additional information here on the suspect captain is uh, one, again, one thing that was difficult for me to understand is it appears that this eyewitness gave a very detailed description, even though we get a brief description word wise, the, right. the, this comp, the composite sketch is very detailed. Now, one other news outlet is stating that the suspect appears to be 30 years of age, approximately with a medium build and witness is, or a witness said that he had a thin scruffy beard with concaved cheeks or concave cheeks. And all this will be very obvious once you see the, the composite sketch. And again, we'll have that information for you on our social media. Yeah. I will post a picture of the composite sketch on Twitter Instagram and Facebook, please share because somebody out there might go, Hey, that's my uncle. That's my uncle butt face. Well, and every week, you know, we thank you and we, we thank you for listening and we thank you for telling a friend, even if you don't share this episode with a friend, share the composite sketch of the suspect and share the description of the vehicle with somebody or on your social media as well. Right. We always look at crime trends in the area when we're looking at these cases because we want to know what's going on. Is there is there something, a bigger thing going on in this area that could give us some insights into who we might be looking for? So I found this bit of information from a source called M Live, and they're discussing the gun assaults and gun violence increasing in this in this exact area around this exact time. And I'll read you the report that I found. It's short here, Captain. It states that from 2020, the years 2020 through 2022, those were the deadliest years in Grand Rapids has seen with a 72% increase in gun assaults. Now, this article is from 2023. So I don't know if that increase continued beyond 2022, but unfortunately, Kane Coronado was killed November 1st, 2022. 72% increase in gun assaults in the Grand Rapids area, the greater Grand Rapids area. Goes on to say, additionally, Grand Rapids recorded around 23 homicide cases in the year of 2022, making it the second deadliest year in the last five years with half of the cases, according to M Live, being preventable. And I'm guessing law enforcement are telling M Live half of these cases, 23 homicides, were preventable. Wow. This is another article from late last year. It actually came out December 27, 2023. This is from woodtv.com. I believe that they're out of Grand Rapids, Michigan here, Captain. They are stating West Michigan's chief federal prosecutor says the region's urban areas continue to see a rise in violent crime. In a wide-ranging interview with News 8, the U.S. attorney for the Western District of Michigan highlighted several concerning crime trends that have taken lives in the year of 2023. They citing illegal guns getting into the wrong hands is partly driving the surge in gun violence. Quote, we have a proliferation of illegal guns in our communities right now, which is helping drive the gun violence epidemic, which is killing more young people than ever before. This man, the attorney general in the area, his name is Mark Totten. And he goes on to say, quote, it's the number one killer of young people right now, end quote. It's sad. I said it last week. We can do better. We should do better. And I don't want to get into a whole gun debate. Longtime listeners of the show will know that we we Please are pro, <laughs> we are we are pro gun for the most part, but there every everything can be correct. Stop right? saying we unless you have a, okay, a well, mouse I in your am, pocket, right? I, I do have a mouse in my pocket yeah. and he mm. is loaded he is <laughs> he, he is armed to the yeah, he's got all kinds of guns. He has big <laughs> Look, while I am pro gun, I also believe that every situation can be sculpted, can be tailored, and can be tightened and tweaked to yes. fit the community. All right, I'm. I don't want to make it a hard and fast rule and say, "Nope, I'm right, you're wrong." No, no. Everything is up for debate, as far as I'm concerned. 
You're flexible you. on this. Stay water is what we always say. Every mm-hmm. situation is a fluid situation. But one thing that I absolutely hate and will not stand for is guns getting in the hands in the wrong hands. So listen to this information. It states that a man by the name of Jarrell Martin of Grand Rapids, this is recently, this is from 2023. He was sentenced to just over three years in prison. This for buying at least 45 guns and selling them to convicted felons. Who is not supposed to have guns? Convicted felons. Who is not supposed to have guns? Convicted felons. This guy was getting his hands on a bunch of guns and then selling them to convicted felons. 45 guns, in fact. Should get a year for every gun he sold. A case that we covered last week. A man gets out of prison, goes and kills another man in his apartment using a firearm. Yeah. Guess what? He's not supposed to have a gun either. How did he? I hope that when Sheldon Johnson is convicted, and I hope what they're working on right now is figuring out how he got his hands on that gun. Yeah. Because there could be a situation like that in the Bronx where you got somebody selling guns to convicted felons putting the guns in the hands of bad people that, and I really wish, do you know how much damage 45 guns being sold illegally to convicted felons could do? I I don't think outrageous. I don't think that three years in prison. I don't, I don't think that that is a large enough sentence, a lengthy enough sentence to deter some of these people from doing. No. And that's the problem. You go, Oh, I, I might get a couple of years. It's worth risking the biscuit. You need to make sure that the sentence that they get is not worth them risking the biscuit. If they go, hey, if I get caught selling these guns, I get five years for every gun I sold and I sold 40 of them. I'm not risking that biscuit. I remember a time where in some states you would get a lengthier prison sentence for selling marijuana than for selling 45 guns to convicted felons. Now, ridiculous. And I said, do you know what kind of damage that could cause somewhere? There's somebody yelling at me. And guess what? You should yell at me. I'm not always right. Yell at me all you want. He's mostly wrong. Yelling at me. Don't yell at the mouse in my pocket. He did nothing wrong. He disowns a lot of guns. He's my only friend. (laughs) You might say, stop speculating what this guy could have done or what damage could have been done. I don't have to speculate because here we go. According to a federal indictment, this is at the federal level at about the highest level that they get. According to a federal indictment on this specific case, those weapons that were sold, it's been confirmed by law enforcement that those weapons were used in multiple shootings in West Michigan, some of which turned deadly. This is their words, not mine. Look, the criminals, if they want to kill somebody, they're going to kill you with a gun, kill you with a knife, they'll strangle you. It's against the law to sell firearms to a felon and so if you do so you should again spend way longer than three years in prison and we know that that oh he he was well behaved so he got out in a year but back to this case what can listeners do to help bring justice in this case people you band together communities band together when when citizens when good people unite that's how we fight crime that's how we fight gun violence. And I, I want to take this moment here to get the listeners angry because sometimes you have to get people angry to get action Yeah, from that, that illegal guns case that we just discussed of those firearms that were sold to convicted felons. One of them was used to kill somebody in the city of Flint, Michigan. One of those guns fired multiple shots on the blue bridge when it was filled with people in downtown grand rapids, Michigan. And one unfortunately killed a two year old in Wyoming, Michigan. Jesus Christ. So the call to action here, people is share this composite sketch of the suspect who is responsible for the death and the murder of Kane Coronado, a young man who was 18 years old out riding his bike. This was a man just starting his life working his first job, living in a, in a good situation with good people and working to better himself. When the hell he's the wheelie king. And I want to applaud the 
Wyoming Police Department for keeping this case in the media, to keep for keeping the suspect composite sketch in the media, keeping the vehicle description in the media and readily available to the eyeballs of all. And here we are delivering it to the earballs of everybody willing to listen. This is a case that as as random as the crime may s- seem on the surface, as we talked about in the first half of the show, a very similar crime in the state of Ohio happened not too long ago that seemed just as random and maybe even a little hopeless at the time when we reported on it. But that case has found that file has now moved into the solved pile. And the very least that we could do for Kane is to share this information and find this person. This person is very distinct looking. And I, we want to, we want to share this composite sketch and hopes that it, that the right person sees it and can provide the right information to law enforcement. There is a reward for information in this case at one time, captain, That reward was $5,000. I believe it's been increased to $6,000. This is being offered by an organization called Silent Observer. They're offering cash for information regarding this case. A reward will go to anyone who helps police find the suspect. We have Crime Stoppers that's involved as well. So if you want to call in a tip anonymously, you can do so with the local Crime Stoppers. But the investigating agency is the Wyoming, Michigan Police Department. Anyone with information regarding the murder of Kane Coronado that took place November 1st, 2022, please reach out to the Wyoming, Michigan Police Department. You can reach them at 616-530-7309. You could be anywhere in the world and you're here in the garage with us and we want to thank you. For everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com and while you're there, sign up on the mailing list. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? This is one of my, maybe my favorite true crime book to have come out this year so far. So this is by a great guy. His name is Bob Cyphers. He's an award-winning journalist and CBS reporter. I was familiar with his work before this book came out. This is his first true crime book, and he was one of the original newspaper and news reporters covering the case when it first happened back in 1992. So the name of the book is Dead End, Inside the Hunt for the Interstate 70 Serial Killer by Bob Cyphers. A little additional information here. For those that don't remember, back in 1992, a store clerk was found shot to death in broad daylight at the Boot Village in St. Charles, Missouri. Nothing was stolen. There was no sexual assault. So the motive seems unclear here. This is a very bizarre crime. They thought it was an isolated murder. And later they find out that there were others that were connected to this murder. Other victims in Indianapolis, Wichita, Terre Haute, and Raytown. And the media quickly dubbed the suspect the I-70 serial killer. He's never been caught, never been captured. Bob is keeping hopes alive with this book. There's new information in this book. Again, it's called Dead End, Inside the Hunt for the Interstate 70 Serial Killer by Bob Cyphers. You can find that recommendation and many more on our recommended page on our website, truecrimegarage.com. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for telling your mama and your papa. Until next week. Be good, be kind, and don't litter.